go. Um, today, uh, I'm going to get the discussion underway, um, sort of set the table and then leave you guys to it because I have to go teach a lab. Okay. <laughs> that happens to the best okay. of us. Okay. But um, we can start with uh, just how we are all doing on this fine day. Um, I am in a weird semester where I am doing a stopgap teaching of a neuroscience class because we had somebody leave. We have somebody new coming, but we have the class in the middle to fill along the way. Um, I'm the one closest to the discipline, uh, which isn't saying much. And so I've been learning a lot about neurons in the last couple of weeks, which uh, <laughs> I really didn't have to think about ever. So that's been enriching, to put it mildly. Uh, Cindy, how are you doing? So I'm doing well. Uh... Just getting into the semester, this is officially our second week, but the first full week. Uh, so just still getting into the groove of things, helping my students to adjust, but so far so good. And of course, thinking about my um, palm studies that I've been trying to do, which is, it's been kind of weird. And I realized that it might take me more than two semesters to complete that. Yeah, yeah just because I, think- I, I don't teach the same courses every time. So it's been weird. <laughs> And I think most people honestly figure out as they get going, it's like, oh, wow, this is like going to be more involved than I realized. So there's more labor involved than I realized. So that's a normal yeah, reaction. That's yeah. good. <laughs> uh, and Mariana, how about you? I, um, I'm still getting over my head <coughs> congestion stuff. So All good. <coughs> I just put in the cough drop, mm. which of course, like stimulates stuff before it starts to work. Um, <laughs> I am doing really great this semester um, just because my course load isn't heavy Mm. and (coughs) getting back into just having more balanced time. It was very hectic for me last semester. Um, Just the amount of meetings that I had to be in, my engagement. And so this semester I feel like is bringing me a lot more balance uh, with my time and being able to have some just downtime in between. I'm not spending nearly as much time grading. I had a huge lecture section last fall. And so I'm just looking forward to just spring coming around because I like warm weather. Nice, nice, nice. So let me show you um, the paper that we're doing right now. And this was chosen somewhat selfishly by me because this has been something I've thought about for a long time, but haven't really gotten very far. Um, I work at a small place. Uh, We only have a thousand students. So our need for this maybe isn't as dire as it is that if I had 437 people in my cohort, and actually that 437 number, I think is only 10% of all the students. So I'm not dealing with high enrollment, but nevertheless, every school every class has issues of people falling through the cracks or of people maybe not wanting to um, or does don't know how to interact with the faculty. And so I really liked the ideas that were present in here in terms of doing something that would allow a formal uh, peer mentorship experience. So this is brought to you at um, UC Santa Barbara. And the idea is to bring people together, new students, this this is a first year group, or mostly first year group, um, with carefully selected upperclassmen, and basically doing the whole how to college thing. Like these uh, peer mentor experiences are not about the content of the course, they're about the methodology of how to succeed. This was an opt-in experience. Um, You didn't have to do it. And they assessed how things were going um, largely on the grounds of, well, not GPA, but grades and how people were doing in a particular chemistry course that had two semesters, which would allow them to measure retention. They were going from the first half to the second half. and just achievement overall. So here you see the conceptual, the theoretical model of what they're hoping to do and everything in the dashed lines um, relates to theory more than practice. And then down here in the red, what they're actually doing and what they're actually measuring. 
And then this table describes who they're looking at over the course of three cohorts. And they've done a really nice job. And I don't even think they, I don't want to say they lucked into it, but the, the opt-in compared to the group you see in just the um, overall pool, pretty similar in terms of their uh, gender ratio, peer ratio, low income ratio, first gen ratio. Um, a couple things struck me off of here was the continued female dominance in the life sciences here with two thirds of these students being female. Um, the really large first gen population, uh, which may, it, maybe that's in the context of my institution, the small, small private liberal arts college, uh, half the students being first gen is something that would be like for this context insane, but probably at UCSB, probably not so much. Um, and then the high achievement, uh, those are good SAT scores <laughs> in terms of both the uh, a biome students and the uh, generic students. And I forgot to mention biome is biology, mentoring and engagement. You have to have the acronym, of course. So I think what I'd like to know from you guys uh, before I turn it over to you, um, what experience at your institutions do you have with peer mentoring? Uh, do you have systems like this where some of your upperclassmen can help new students? Cindy. Yeah, so I'm new to new to you, Hart, but I have heard of a mentoring program that is run through our Center for Student Success. It's completely informal, and they, it's basically this near peer mentoring. So they try to get students who are, have similar backgrounds and so on, um, but I don't know the details of how that mentoring impacts um, whether you look at the retention rates or attrition rates or anything like that. But what I do know that our department does with the um, tutoring center, which also falls under that same uh, student success center umbrella, is what is known as a peer support workshop. But that is course specific. And instead of going through um, just social behaviors, they actually go through course material. And that has been helpful in getting students to number one, stay in the course, pass the course and move on to you know, in their sequence. Right. Um, what I found different here is that they're focusing on that social aspect too mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. metacognition, which I think it's something that we don't always um, do when we're mentoring students. So I, I was pretty impressed by that. Yeah, and I think one of the things to notice here is that you're in a unique position to actually have a pretty robust data set just by looking at their own classes. Um, they've yes. got the numbers, uh, they've got the comparable group here. And so lots of places have tried it. They're trying to show it works sort of related to what you're talking about there. Um, certainly a strength. Yeah. Mariana, have you seen anything like this? Not like this per se, but just a peer mentoring model. Um, no, well, okay. yes, but not formalized in this way in terms of the assessment. Um, yeah, there's a yeah. lot more quantitative data that um, is provided in this actual study. So I would say, and, and Cindy's heard me say this on Monday, um, we are um, in the process of building a summer research bridge program. Hmm. And in that programming, we have actually put together um, some mixed method data um, information that we've obtained from those students, but the cohorts are small. Yeah. So looking at this model in terms of, well, and then this has been over years that they were able to actually um, obtain this data from the students, which is great because again, we do have large enrollment courses in biology. However, we don't have it set up where it is a, a direct line of graduate students, or I would say upperclassmen in this case, or how they've modeled the mentorship program, they're capitalizing the students that have kind of already gone through. And then they're asking those students to kind of give back to the, the, the freshmen or sophomore students taking the classes. And when you mentioned it as a bridge program, are the targets then people who are coming into the college? Yes, they're first, they're first generation um, underrepresented students. So, so they come early. 
they they're coming in um, with a research experience or right. a, a research internship, I would say. Okay. And then I'm continuing to follow those students because now I've bridged them to STEM through the summer opportunity. But then those students are still in STEM. And so now they've continued with the first year research program. And so I'm still connected with those students. I'm developing them with their research experience, understanding their development during this first year, but I am not formally assessing them. I so um, so yeah, again, I, I think that this is really, really nice to see how yeah. this is modeled. And as both of you have pointed out, the assessment of this is its strength. Um, we had had some discussion, um, this is our second uh, session with this paper. We had had some discussion the other day about if the instruments are the right instruments. Um, they're using enrollment in a chemistry course to assess the biology curriculum, which in and of itself isn't terrible given, you know, I think we all have chemistry requirements, right? But um, what the efficacy of that is, um, there's always, I guess, the question about uh, the appropriateness of using grades, like, okay, I'm seeing an increase in grades, therefore things are better. So um, probably knowing a little more about how they are doing, um, how they are doing the grading in this particular class would make this more uh, useful to us. But then we also have this idea, uh, this terminology they use here, academic habit complexity. And so part of that is metacognition. Uh, part of that is study skills, like just the idea of what they are doing in their um, academics that allow them to potentially um, develop better habits to uh, succeed where they had before. And on that note, what I would invite you guys to do is sort of talk between yourselves about the strengths and weaknesses of this paper. Um, I'm going to arbitrarily pick Cindy as host, congratulations. Um, and I appreciate, this is gonna be recorded, so your insights will be valuable for everyone, not just you. Um, and please continue with this conversation and I apologize for having to drop out here so early. Thank you guys. Thank you. So it's just us now. Um, yeah, so the methodologies, I didn't focus a whole lot on them because as you know, the scholarship of teaching and learning is completely new to me. Um, so I would love for us to talk about it and um, sort of go through what we think are possible strengths and weaknesses with you know, with the caveat that we could be off. It's yeah, not really a strong I, I, mind. I guess my, my question for you would be, um, <clears throat> could you see yourself in a few years developing some type of um, mentorship model uh, that share. can, you know, like you could focus on genetics in, in the case of, you know, the concept of how this is actually structured because that's mm -hmm. your specialty. And again, um, when you're invested in a certain, you know, a certain focus that you can actually kind of capitalize on students that really are engaged with, with genetics that you can see really giving back in terms mm -hmm. of that structure because um, most biology students are going to take some level of genetics too. Yeah, that is true. So one thing that I did think about in as I was reading the paper, is how to possibly use something that we already have mm -hmm. and make it better. Mm -hmm. So we have that peer support workshop that I mentioned, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if in addition to going through the academics and they were going through problems and things like that, there was a component that focused on things like met metacognition mm -hmm. and study habits, just the mm -hmm. behavioral aspect of it, mm -hmm. you know, because you can go through problems with a student all day long, but if mm -hmm. they don't have um, sort of the organizational skills and the willpower, the discipline to go back afterwards and to think about what they've been learning and to go through it on their own, then it's to me, it wouldn't be as beneficial as it could be. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that's why I was so impressed by that aspect of this um, mm -hmm. mentoring strategy. 
is I feel like it's missing in so many others. You know, we focus on, okay, academics, you have to do this, you have to do that. These are the topics and here you go. But most students don't even know how to study. Right. And so what right. they do with you is it, it starts and ends right there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do we take something that we have and make it better? That was sort of where I was, you know, considering it. And I feel like I will have that discussion with uh, right. the folks who run this program for us. Right. Um, also ask your department if they have, because um, it looks to me like they developed a one credit course that helped to structure this actual mentorship um, with, with the older, older students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's ours is a one credit course as well. It's an official course. Okay, so, well, okay, so you have it, you have that built in already. Mm -hmm. It's I just think missing it's just, the behavioral component. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And, and then, of course think, the assessment. There's no assessment involved. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh-huh. I know that right. And that's the same place that I am um, with my undergraduate research programming with my students. Um mm -hmm. I think at this point, I'm so focused on making sure that they're retained. Um, I'm not, you know, I think my focus hasn't been nearly in the assessment part of the undergraduate research itself by the students. Um, I think that we are going to build that over time, the more we continue with our bridge programming. The other thing I do believe is that our undergraduate research program here um they can really probably um structure some type of assessment that uh can focus on mentorship so i think these are just things that have been talked about but just never came into an actual fruition i think yeah. they're just again about making sure they're retaining the students in their undergraduate research appointments rather than focusing heavily on how they're developing, what are they thinking? Um, how does this tie to their STEM courses? You know, it's just kind of, there's a right. disconnect there, I believe. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There's so much, you know, we, most universities have certain things in place already. Yes. But reading this paper gave me so many ideas of how to make it even better. Right, with right. And the other thing is, is that departments have to pay the faculty mentor, the faculty instructor to actually um, have a curriculum for this. You know, mm -hmm. how is it going to be structured in terms of when they actually come together for that course time? So that's more investment on that department level um, and college level. And that still has to be approved through the college. And so there's just so many other things that, um, go into developing this type of mentorship uh, right. structurally. Right. Yeah. So ours are completely student run. So there's a, a professor that oversees them and provides the um, question sets and problem sets and so on. But other than that, it's it's hands off. OK. And the mm -hmm. upper level students are the ones who run it. So are the mm -hmm. tutors. Um, so it would be interesting to see how we'd be able to incorporate the, the metacognition and the training that the, the peer mentors would need before they can actually execute this with the right. Of students. Right. So that would be pretty interesting. But I do love, you know, the things that they're focusing on, like a sense of belonging. So many students after the first year, they, they, there's always a disconnect and they hope to settle in, but they never do. And so they quit. Mm -hmm. right? or, so they, that, or, they, or they switch majors exactly exactly mm -hmm. I like the fact that uh, in one of the sections they talked about the structure of science in general and the fact that it doesn't always foster that sense of belonging right you know the curriculums are almost overwhelming mm -hmm. you know you look at a first year curriculum you use 20 credits and it's all of these courses they, they mm -hmm. have very little and time. labs <laughs> labs that go for three hours right. you know there's very little time for them to think of their own behaviors <clears throat> and to develop their own behaviors and these different skills that they need to succeed mm -hmm. you know I, I feel like all of the emphasis is placed strictly on the academics mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. first year with the mm -hmm. hopes that they got whatever they got from the first year seminar <laughs> right you know? 
Well, that doesn't always work. And the idea of prioritizing independence, that is also true. We figured that by second year, they can function on their own, but that's often not the case. No, and, 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 and a lot of STEM students may be struggling with courses. Um, and it's very hard for them to reach out to a faculty instructor to be like, I'm not doing well, mm -hmm. what can I do to improve? And traditionally, most, most professors will say, just spend more time with it. And that's, yeah. that is not really a good, that's not a good answer for students. Right, right. Um, they need more assistance. They need more instru uh, instructional uh, learning assistance support mm -hmm. to sit down and help them figure out how to actually approach a better understanding of the material. So right, the whole idea that, of learning to learn, right? <laughs> right, that the content is very overwhelming. And mm -hmm. it's no way professors can actually get through everything in a chapter unit. So again, I think um, students being able to meet what they need to, to understand and know halfway, and then the actual professor providing the other, you know, meeting point for helping that student be successful mm -hmm. is another aspect I think that that it's not that's not captured in this actual you know study yeah and the, the whole idea and that is something I, I I'm so glad you brought that up how do professors so we don't all have access to programs like BioMe we don't no thank so you. what can we do in our classrooms to mimic this but mm -hmm. with the understanding that we still do have to teach actual content right you know, how do we do this in our classroom so one of the things that i thought about was discussion boards that i do, do not monitor and i tell okay. them i'll have this discussion board open that they should go in there and ask questions mm -hmm. and i encourage people who know the answers to those questions to put it in. So share your thoughts, share your opinions and ask mm -hmm. the questions. This way we, we kind of build a community because mm -hmm. especially with COVID when students are hybrid or you know they're not all together all at once and they're afraid to spend time together because you know they don't want to get sick. Mm -hmm. How do we still have that community and how do we still have that peer to peer sort of teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. um, when we don't have access to programs like these. Right, right. And these types of programs, again, I always go back to the money because it's mm -hmm. cost. So I think that this is, again, really um, awesome in terms of being able to actually capture the data, um, utilize that in the actual programming that has been established. Mm -hmm. But then my other, my other question is, is this still actually in place at the institution? Oh, that's a good question. Ah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, this could have been grant, grant funded and right. this may no longer even continue to exist mm -hmm. um, at, at, that, at that institution. So I think that will be another question to actually follow up with. Is this still, is, does this still actually exist as um, a program? Well, the paper was just published. Okay. So, you know, 2001. So we, I, I don't know, but it is a good question. How will they sustain it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is it mm -hmm. sustained? But, you know, you see Santa Barbara is a huge yes. university. So possibly yes. they have. I'm sure. Yeah. I can assume that they have the funding for it okay. in their department. Uh-huh. Um, not like our small private right, institutions. Right, right. And it also depends on the institution, the student body size, you know. Yeah, that's one thing that Michael students. brought up. Yeah. The fact that they had only 10% of their, the classroom opt into it. And mm -hmm. they still had this massive number of participants, right? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty mm -hmm. impressive. Right, right. That's mm -hmm. pretty impressive. And yeah. hence the, the great data sets. Um, right. Can we talk about their methods a little bit? And the, the way yes, um, it looks yes. like they ran several tests. Um, and I think, too, in terms of how they decided to run, you know, their regression models. Mm -hmm. um, 
I would need somebody to kind of walk me through that a little bit more. Okay. So yeah, this is not my strong suit either. And I was hoping <laughs> to get some input from. <laughs> well, and, to, and, it, and I'll tell you, that is very typical when you have large data sets that they run different types of actual mm -hmm. models. Um, yeah. So I know they were very keen to ensure that there was statistical significance yes. um, in the, the differences yes. they were seeing in, in the performance right. of these students. Right. So they, right. They did like... Now that, that is difficult to do when you only have 10 students. Right. That you will cannot. Actually the sample size is too small. The sample size is too small. And again, this cannot, this cannot, um, cross over to smaller institutions um, in terms of validity, um, in terms of actually getting the same significance, it's right. not likely to happen. So yes, it was, it's definitely strong in how they um, decided to run the regressions, mm -hmm. but um, I just don't know if that would actually cross over to smaller institutions. And that's kind of where I am with my small cohorts that I'm following, yes. how would are I you, actually de develop a model for that? Are you allowed to pool data from multiple semesters? I'm sure, I'm sure I can. I'm sure that, but um, each of the semesters, the enrollments are so different mm -hmm. that I would have to actually be purposed in how many students will be randomly selected out right. of each section. So Right. Yeah. So that's something I mentioned that to Michael when I first logged in. Okay. I realized with, and we'll talk about this in our meeting. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I realized that the scholarship of teaching and learning, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's so different from, you know, the hard basic sciences that we do. Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with students and it, the <clears throat> unpredictability of enrollment and what classes you'll, you'll be teaching and so on. And so it was interesting that they were using a course that was completely separate. Right. So, so they were using this chemistry course that's right. a prereq for, mm -hmm. um, for the bio courses, chemistry mm -hmm. 1B, um, mm -hmm. as their, their predictor, mm -hmm. right? That was, that was sort of, I, it's it's strange. I, I, I don't know if that's typical. <laughs> Go ahead. I, well, I think because, and when we've talked about this within my department and with my faculty colleagues, that chem, that, those chemistry courses can cause a huge attrition out of STEM. Mm -hmm. So I believe that's why they focused on the chemistry because once students have to take it, they either don't score well in the course or that is the thing that makes them leave. So I think yeah. that biology is more conceptual you're doing so much more math and chemistry. That, it's very abstract too. Yes. And sometimes that, students have a right. With so, that. but I think they, I think they chose to focus on that chemistry um, as a predictor or a factor in in whether those students will actually um, stay within within their STEM disciplines. So that's where that study skill persistence, mm -hmm. metacognition, yes. <clears throat> all of that plays into um, how the student is actually succeeding through the remainder of their programs. So we lose a lot of students once they get to, it's not the chemistry, the intro chemistry is all the, um, the like chemistry 109 and 110. At the it's general the organic. Oh, yeah. okay. It's the organic or the biochem. So mm -hmm. once they get to that level, I, we've had a lot of students that just say they switch their major or they yeah. go and they just strictly go and they say, nope, I'm just going to be a biology major mm -hmm. because then um, that still that moves them more into an ecology area where they can complete out their program by choosing just biology courses okay, and not have that other component like of the pre-med pre -med stuff. The, the there you go. And That's calculus exactly and right. all of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I always mm -hmm. found that kind of interesting from my own personal experiences, because when I was an undergrad, I wasn't so keen on the general chemistry. I found it a little bit boring, but I loved organic chemistry mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. it, and it's sort of the opposite for most students. They're, mm -hmm. they're fine mm -hmm. with the general chemistry and they just, there's right. always a problem with the organic. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I think, and, I, and I'll say it is the way it's taught, large lectures, you're just sitting back, 
you know, you're not engaged. Mm -hmm. You get more engagement out of the recitation because you're doing right. more problem solving, right. figuring out with your peers. So I would imagine that's where you see the most effort from students. Um, but then again, in this case, I, could, I do see why they chose to focus on the chemistry mm -hmm. course in terms of performance and retention, because that's it's hard for them. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Interesting. I'm glad that you brought up the idea of large courses. Like a, that's probably what they have given the mm -hmm, size of the university. Mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. The fact that you're literally one of 500 mm -hmm. in a lecture hall. And it's hard to get your professor's attention. You know, to, if you have a question, what do you do? Does your professor have the capacity to reach each individual student? And the, the answer is probably no. Mm -hmm. likely I would say you probably so, would get more interaction from your recitation exactly and so I guess the onus is on the student to mm -hmm. take that responsibility for their, mm -hmm. their learning which mm -hmm. is where the metacognition kind of comes in right because they right. have to be able to look back at what they're doing and to think critically mm -hmm. about how they're learning what they're learning where they might be going wrong and to go back and fix that Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I would be interested in is what instrument was used for the um, kind of metacognition, psychosocial aspects. And I didn't, I, they said that was in a supplementary. Yeah, I did not look at the supplemental. I, yeah, I didn't either. But it would be interesting to see how they went about doing that. <laughs> right. And also the if they provided details on the training that the mentors underwent to be able to because that's another qualitative aspect that you know mm -hmm. this is very strong quant quantitative mm -hmm. data again that helps in their regression analysis um but i i, I really like the qualitative um components when it comes to this um because my um dissertation pulls generally from first generation students and science self-efficacy. So um, the, the authors that I'm seeing even um, presented in the lit review or the background data, I, I, I went straight to, because I was like, yep, I know what this is. I know what this is. I know exactly what they mean by yeah. um, retention, um, mm -hmm. that attrition out of STEM. So I think for me, I'm not, I'm not as focused on the quantitative. Again, it's easy to have this large data coming from mm -hmm. these, this big institution. But I think that at the same time, it also would be interesting to see, like you said, how are the mentors being prepared in the program? Um, what are they doing in terms of a prescription that helps these students to stay retired? Right, is there parity now? across the board for the mentors? Right. And I, How I are they have, pairing the mm -hmm. students, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, and the time. So I know that there were groups of six mentees mm -hmm. and a, okay. mentor, a student mentor, and they were um, separated at tables. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the professor who was sort of running the program, the course, <coughs> would go through and sort of monitor but it was mm -hmm. mostly about them spending time together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to see, or just to know more about the interactions between the mentees themselves. Right. And then the mentee versus mentor. Yes. Yep. That would exactly. be interesting as well. You, you know, the behavioral aspect is always super interesting because like mm -hmm. you said, qualitative data, how are you measuring? How are you measuring this? Yep. How are you measuring this? And the end... Um, well, I, and the qualitative does provide more richness and explanations mm -hmm. that follows up with the quantitative. Um, so again, in terms of how this, this is actually structured, I just, I, I love what they've done. Um, it, it's a, it will be a starting basis in terms of having a strong mentorship program that retains students in STEM. So, so yeah, and it looks like they one credit course, 10 week long mentorship training program that meet that mm -hmm. met weekly for 50 minutes. Yes. So, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good 
it's a good study. And then, you know, with Cresswell and Clark, um, that is exactly what I'm doing in terms of my own mixed method study. So I want to okay. be able to, I want you to tell, I want students to report what their own science self-efficacy is, Yeah. but then they're provided the opportunity to give a narrative as to why they feel that way. Yeah, See, so I'm more me, about the explanation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because then you're forcing them to think about what they're doing and the why. It's not right. just here it is. They yes. really have to look at themselves critically, which is not something we often do. Right. right? And, it, and, and it just helps the student to reflect on, wow, I mean, I didn't realize, you know, how I think about biology. You know, a lot of students report they just did not have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And so that can carry into any STEM fields that they like have always had an interest in, but they're afraid to actually um, move through the program because they think, oh my gosh, I had such a horrible experience. I don't know if I'm even good at it. So, yeah. And we hear that all too often, right? Mm -hmm. You know, students. very often. Yep, very often. There's the issue of grit and mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. able this whole growth mindset idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't work out the first time, what do you do? Do you quit or do you mm -hmm. persist? And mm -hmm. if you are going to persist, how do you make it different? How, mm -hmm. What do you do differently? Mm -hmm. right? So being able to reflect on your own behaviors and to try to analyze those behaviors, see how it could have impacted the outcome that you experienced. I think mm -hmm. it's so important at every level. Right. Right. I so agree. very important. Yes, I hear you. Um, tell me more about the mixed methods. So um, mixed methods is a research design that allows you, like in this case, you have a lot of strong quant data that's being analyzed. But when you do um, when you do a mixed method study, you can, depending upon the sequence in which you run the data analysis. You can run the quantitative um, test first and mm -hmm. then come back and um, analyze or transcribe the qualitative um, information or data that you're collecting in mm -hmm. your study. So in this case, the metacognition stuff will probably be that qualitative um, explanation for how are you studying? Um, that's more of a students providing the, the basis for their behavior, which you can't, you likely can't measure, but they provide a narrative or some follow up into how they're thinking or what they're doing. And so that it gives, it gives that the more observational information. So it provides more of an, it provides more of that this is how they're scoring. So grade, GPA, mm -hmm. those are those, you know, quantitative measures. But then the metacognition stuff, how are you studying? How do you feel when you're studying? You know, that gives the, the more in-depth explanation as to how they are performing with the other data stuff that's provided. All right, okay. So I'm thinking again, back to our classrooms and how we could do this. Mm -hmm sort of just within our little groups of 25 <laughs> students. A, yeah, you can do, remember, um, if you remember, I told you I am providing a pre, mid, and post assessment yes. that is mm -hmm. capturing um, how students feel yes. about the course as they're learning. Mm -hmm. And then I provide, um, and I'm doing this, I have this set up in Canvas. So basically it's a, it's a survey that they get points to take. Yeah. And it's built into the course. So you, I'm able to capture that data. Um, and it, it provides a, a so much more richer explanation for how they feel about their own science self-confidence. Mm -hmm. So you, this is something that, again, you can develop um, in your genetics course and just have yeah. it rolled into. So I do, it's so informal, you know, teaching, like, this type of scholarship is completely new to me. Okay. Um, 
and so I do what I call a class climate survey. I, I yes. get feedback on mm-hmm. how they feel about each component that I have. Mm-hmm. But what is sort of the standard way to do this? Is that an acceptable method? To oh, include? yeah, because it just, one, it helps you. Well, one, like I said, it helps you, the students, to give you feedback in terms of how you're teaching. Is this working? You know, right. they're not going to necessarily, like, tell you. Right, that's what well, I use it for. <laughs> just yeah, to, they ain't gonna tell you until they, until they do the course evaluation. All right. <laughs> so then that right. way we you you know it provides some type of a, some type of feedback mm-hmm. that helps you and it helps the students. Right. And the great thing is is that you know if you employ that through Canvas, then you can provide feedback to the student when they say I really don't do well when I have to just read the content and then do the homework questions Mm -hmm. or do the problem sets because I don't know where to begin Mm -hmm. and I don't know if I'm doing it right. So then that way you can say, okay, this is great because if you are unsure about if you are even accurate in, you know, practicing the information, then come to office hours or come Mm -hmm. to my LA or here, I'm going to set you up where we're going to really structure you in that recitation time. So that it helps again bridge the student to improve if they are actually providing some kind of indication that they just don't know if they're even doing their study approach yeah. right. Yeah, that's interesting. I will so it's something to think about because I usually use a survey format where mm-hmm. I I don't do the instant feedback because I don't know <coughs> who said what. Uh-huh. It's just um de-identified. Yeah, you de-identified. But, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But having them do this in a way where I can identify the student, I think would be very helpful. Right. The other thing is, gosh, and now I'm blanking on what I was about. Oh, the other thing is in the classroom, I've started doing these um, concept, like reflective writing, where I have them write it in a notebook, take a picture of it Mm -hmm. and upload it to Blackboard. I put a link in there, they upload it, and I get to look back to see how they are interpreting these different concepts. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not a test question. It's just me asking a question and they have to write down the answer right. or what comes to mind. And I say, you know, don't look at your notes. Don't look at the slides. Just tell me what's in your head right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what I realized from going through those is that sometimes there are major disconnects that I never would have, you know, sort of anticipated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, major major mm-hmm. disconnects like asking about a nucleotide and having a student respond to me um, about base pairing that mm-hmm. is not something I would ever anticipate hearing like mm-hmm. how did you go from a nucleotide to base pairing and so now that I know who those students are because they had to submit it right I can pull them aside and that's basically what you just described being able to give that kind of feedback is so important I agree. And then I think it personalizes um, the success of the student um, because now we are in a place where we we know this and Mm -hmm. now we have a way to be able to actually approach the student, you know, that is meaningful for them because they like, oh, wow, you know, um, Dr. Cindy really cares about if I'm getting this or not. And I think that, again, being able to personalize it for a better outcome with the students um, makes a difference over time because then you're able to help them to see that yes you can actually um, approach this with a better way to learn rather than what you the memorizing or what Mm -hmm. they bring in from high school or that this is how they hear the other friends actually try you know how they actually learn in the course and so that right. approach may work for them but that may not work for your student absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. and it's so hard to get them away from the habits of high school the habits of others you know, the or the habits that they came and yep. just memorize, trying they to memorize help. everything yep, yep. So, I you, gotta help so them, you have to help them parsing out how to process that information right and if you've been doing this this exact way you know for the last couple of weeks and you fail the first exam is not I working want, for you uh-huh. right I want them to get to a place where they can say okay this is what I did I I, I focused on this method of learning mm-hmm. and it did not work because I failed 
instead right. of saying something must have been wrong with the exam and that's why I failed. Yeah. Which uh, is sort uh, of the way they usually go. Oh yeah. And that's a maturity thing too, because most of my students indicate my exams are challenging. Mm -hmm. And I say, yes, because my exams are well, one, first of all, we're not in high school anymore. Right, there's so that level to be challenging. of just recalling information mm -hmm. is not application of the information or application of the material. I say, hey, if you're going in the pre health, you, you got to be able to get your IV solutions right. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want you giving me the wrong, you know, concentration. And so um, that is a hard um, transition for students because they're like, oh my gosh, I have to really think about. Yes. what it is that this is asking yeah. me and so that's it goes more into critical thinking rather than recall I, we can all recall information I mean that's and that's a exactly. simple uh, uh, you know automatic process but when it comes to critically thinking in mm -hmm. science that's where the challenge lies for a lot of STEM majors because they, they like oh my gosh I have to actually critically think about this yeah, and I don't put know, it all I'm, together and use it and, you, and, and it doesn't, and I'm not getting the exact answer. That is so hard for students because they like, I, I'm not, I'm failing because I'm not getting yeah. the exact answer. And I was like, no, that's, that's where I want you to like really um, remove that process of thinking. What I want you to do is to really think about how the concepts are teaching us um, how things work in the natural world. We can't see it. We can't mm -hmm. just look it up and it's an automated answer. You know, things are, we're constantly learning new information about science or in biology or, you know, moving to a deeper level of what is actually occurring in those systems that that changes all the time. But we thought in the seventies, right. you know, it's That's still surface material. Yes. Then now we got CRISPR and, you know, yes. there's just so many more other things yeah. that we are actually applying to science that that critical thinking is really um, important to develop in students, you know, early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's everything. It should be as important as the material itself. Yes. Right? Ensuring that they know how to learn. And that's one of the reasons why I thought the methods they used here, sort of what they were focusing on in the mentoring <clears throat> program was just so impressive. The, mm -hmm. the social aspect is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. seen students become stuck because they couldn't get past the fact that what they were doing was wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not working. How do I convince you it's not working? Mm -hmm. I mean, you mm -hmm. see your grades. Mm -hmm. You have to change the way you study. You have to change your approach. Mm -hmm. and, they, because, and the other thing, you know, the other thing, Cindy, you got to spend more time on it. You can't just sit down at the end of the week and, and think, oh, four hours of just going over the material is going to yeah, work. Yes. You have to practice it every day. I tell them that, you know, be like your little <coughs> child self again. Be a six-year-old again. Ask lots of questions if you don't understand something, ask, look it up. Don't just gloss over anything. When you get back on your own, try to do it on your own. You know how kids get to this point where, you know, they, they become assertive and they want, I can do it by myself. I don't mm -hmm, need your help. Mm -hmm, I have a two and a half mm -hmm. year old now, and he wants to pick his own outfits. And mm -hmm. so it's hands off for mom. Be mm -hmm. that way. Try it on your own. That's the way you figure out if you know it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone's constantly helping you, you don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is them. And, you're, you're literally using them as a crutch. Right. And the other thing that um, what I'm teaching my students to, to do is to push through the challenge. When we go into photo systems and mm -hmm. all the steps involved um, when it comes to just how electrons are transported. Yes. That is so overwhelming that they just kind of like, they, they feel like they're drowning. And I have to reassure them that it seems overwhelming. It seems like a challenge, but we're going to parse out how we actually approach mm -hmm. this. We're going to take a systems approach. Let's understand the pathway. Let's understand what is actually happening in the order. Then we can focus on all the tiny little steps that occur within. You're not going to get them all right. I also reassured them of that. I was like, 
I'm not mm-hmm. focused on if you get it all correctly. I just want to make sure you're understanding the overall concept right. of how this is occurring within and where it's happening. So absolutely. It's like, you know, map it out, draw it out. What we're is gonna, the we're story? Gonna, we're gonna, and that's what I say. We're going to work it out together. We'll yeah. What is together. the story of electron transport in cellular respiration or mm-hmm. in um, the photosystems for photosynthesis? There's always a story. So right. what is that story? And now draw it out and you'll mm-hmm. find that everything falls into place because the different molecules are basically just different actors and everyone mm-hmm. has a role. They do their role that helps to tell the story. Mm-hmm. So and that's you know, kind of my, that's my approach to it. And it seems to work, but it's hard to get them out of the whole, okay, I need to look at this and I need to memorize it. Right. Now, you know what else, you know what else is interesting when we talk about this paper? I have a lot of chem, uh, students that are chemistry majors and they have to take a bio um, course just to fulfill their program requirement outside of their focus. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of students that say, I am awesome in chemistry but I am not good in biology. And that is really interesting to hear because Mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, how STEM is supposed to be all interconnected. Students will will compartmentalize Mm -hmm. chemistry from biology. And so they, it's almost like, it's almost like having STEM majors have to take this English course and, and all this literary stuff. And they like, I don't like this. I'm not good at this. So it's also mm-hmm. helping them to bridge their thinking about yes. what is more analytical in ter- and, you know, chemistry is data, you mm-hmm. know, data sets. So um, I think that that's also interesting where um, they're using the, the chemistry courses to yes. capture retention. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a very, very good point. Mm-hmm. So I, I, if you point. get a chance, ask any of your students who may have actually, who might be chemistry majors, um, or if they pre-health or whatever, say, hey, let me know, were you always really more focused on the chemistry um, as opposed to the biological systems or biological forces and see what they say? Yeah, that's so a, take a little a survey. Very interesting concept. And now I, I want to know, you know, what yep. which one do you guys prefer? Which one do you what, find what easier? Do you like, yes. If and then what chemistry. about it makes it easier for you? Is it the teacher? Is it um, the time of day? Because that's a factor too, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Is mm-hmm. your biology class at 8 a.m. and your chemistry class at, you know, noon? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you prefer mm-hmm. chemistry? It's very interesting, how, you know, what you just mentioned that, about yep, separating yep, and, them rather than seeing it all as something right things that go together really yep because I'm I'm um some of my students have already taken their pre-assessment um since we started the semester and I'm reading that right now where they're like mm-hmm. I actually I I enjoy chemistry more than I did biology so now I'm having to rethink about you know all of this since I took it in high school and I didn't I was never really good at it and it didn't interest me and so now I'm helping them to make a connection. What do mm-hmm. you what do you find in the course you think you're gonna actually enjoy learning more about? So I think making it individualized for the student also helps to bring that connection to like genetics. I got yes. a lot of students that say, I wanna yes. learn no more about my genetics and how that brought me mm-hmm. into, you know, yeah, how so those genes are just who make up the combination. Of I it. always try my very best to make the examples I use as personal as possible. As personal as, as because possible. Because as with, especially with genetics, students hear that word and they're like, oh no. <laughs> <coughs> right. But when I uh, explained, so I'm all about storytelling. Mm-hmm. Every class is a story. You know, mm-hmm. why did they care about this? So we've, we've just started to introduce the topics and how this um, DNA was, the structure was elucidated and all of that stuff. And so we went through the stories from Mendel. You know, Mendel knew that something was being inherited. But they didn't know what. They had a few options, proteins, uh, you know, de- nucleic acids. They didn't know. So how mm-hmm. did they figure it out? Mm-hmm. What were some of the mm-hmm. key experiments? You make, yeah, we, you make it all. Mm-hmm. We talk make about like Griffith, we talk about Hershey and Chase and, and all of those, just the key experiments. And then it starts to click. And I always start with, you know, 
who looks like mom, who looks like dad? Why do you look like mom and dad? Well, because I have the same genes as them or similar genes. Like, yeah, did you know that back in this day, they didn't know this. They didn't mm -hmm. know it was about DNA. So here's mm -hmm. how they figured it out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So that kind of helps them to realize it's not abstract at all. No, it's not abstract. <laughs> nope, nope. And it's something they couldn't see. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. Why didn't um, Mendel just look inside of the plants and, and mm -hmm. figure out what was in there. Mm -hmm. Well, because mm -hmm. number one, they didn't know that DNA was even inherited. Mm -hmm. And number two, he had no way of looking in those cells. Right. He didn't exactly. have any microscope. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, he did have a microscope. He don't know what he would have been looking exactly. for anyway. <laughs> in my um in my intro to <clears throat> course where we talk about um, like Carl Linnaeus and taxonomy. Mm -hmm. You know, he used all observations, mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. features, like, mm -hmm. you know, physical features are so finicky. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't always mean relatedness, but why did he have to do that? Why didn't he just use DNA uh, data? Why didn't he sequence their, their genes mm -hmm. and figure it out? Well, sequencing didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have a way to look at DNA. Mm -hmm. There's no way to do mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. he used what he could. And yep. so all of that makes sense. Right, right. Because I think sometimes yeah. they forget that the technology changed a lot. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Over recent years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it looks like we had time. Yes. So yes. this was, again, a very rich discussion for just us two. And it gave us some time to actually spend we some time did. together. We did. Uh, so. so great conversation. Yeah. And um We'll chat. What is yeah, it? Yeah, I'll week? see you again next week, and we'll next we'll week. get get our strategy in terms of what you want to focus on this semester. And absolutely. So, like I say, I'm I'm really trying to plan to to come up to Minnesota in July. So to oh. Connecticut, the author cold. Place. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I mean, <laughs> with the palm gathering I, in July. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And then um, I think if I can and. Um, when, when are you all, how far out, when does your semester end? Early May. Early May. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Now I'll figure out something in terms of my logistics and. I know the travel. I don't think that it's going to happen for me. I am still so I, concerned about COVID. Oh no. Yeah. It, and it's, it's bad now. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll figure been, out what we want to do. It's been so unfortunate. I was looking forward to having the um, ability to visit. Yeah. But, yeah. It, well, it's too hard right and everything. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. But we'll chat. We'll, we'll chat. chat. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Okay. I'll see you see next you. week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>